We've already seen how neurosurgery started with trepanation of the skull and how advancements were made throughout ancient history thanks to well-known physicians. Hippocrates of the Hippocratic Oath, an ancient Greek who performed trepanation and wrote treatises on head injuries, as well as Galen, his Roman disciple, and perhaps the world's first neurophysiologist. As we move into the Middle Ages, however, we find that surgery, and especially neurosurgery, experienced some of its greatest revolutions at the hands of a man without comparable fame, Al-Zahrawi, Latinized as Albucasis. He was in fact one of the founding fathers of modern surgical practice. This video is going to dig deep into his pioneering work, including those that impact neurosurgery to this day. Remember to like the video and subscribe so you don't miss out. Abu al Qasim ibn al Abbas al Zahrawi al Ansari, or al Zahrawi as we'll call him can trace his ancestry back to Medina in the Arabian Peninsula. He was, in fact, born in Spain around the 10th century, 936, not far from the Andalusian city of Cordoba, a focal point of culture and learning during the Islamic Golden Age. Not much is known about his personal life, but what we do know was that he devoted his life to the people of his city. He practiced there his whole life, establishing himself as some sort of physician who saw his students as his children and who treated all his patients equally, whether they were the poorest of the poor or courtesans of the caliphate that he served for over 50 years. Perhaps aided by his uncommon grasp of human anatomy, surgery was his preferred domain, what he considered the pinnacle of medicine. In this field, his accomplishments are numerous. He invented so many tools with which to inspect orifices like the ear, nose, throat, and urethra. He's credited with performing the first ever thyroidectomy, performing lithotomies, tonsillectomies, and ligating giant aneurysms, which in other parts of the world would have incurred a massive mortality. He was also an active proponent of cauterization, using his knowledge of the Hippocratic corpus to help stop blood loss in his adult and pediatric operations, as well as to remove minor lesions such as skin cancers and warts. Moreover, his pet monkey ate the cat gut strings on his musical instrument. He realized that such a material could would do well as sutures due to the natural biodegradation, an innovation that's still in use today. However, the true depth of his surgical understanding is best grasped through his knowledge of neurology and neurosurgery. Al-Zahrawi engaged with a great deal of spinal and cranial pathology, doing so from the symptomatic level through to greater management. For example, when a patient had a facial palsy, he would cauterize the normal side at targeted points along the distribution of the facial nerve to make the patient's deformity less obvious. He would also apply this technique to intractable pain through his knowledge of spinal root entry points, something he said could only be achieved through mastery of anatomy and conducted by those who had achieved that. When it came to the skull, he was well known for his S and T-shaped incisions of the scalp before progressing to tried and true trepanation, much the same method that we use today to take out intracranial tumors or bleeds. He also engaged with pediatric or children's neurosurgery in the form of hydrocephalus, writing, I have seen a baby boy whose head was abnormally enlarged with prominence of the forehead and sides to the point that the body became unable to hold it up. Having been one of the first to identify it, he was the first documented surgeon to be able to treat hydrocephalus through removal of superficial intracranial fluid. Now let's talk about the fractures. As a gentleman in the 900s, Al-Zahrawi had loads of experience with violent fractures. Unsurprising when everyone around him would be carrying a sword or a mace. When applied to the head, he classified these injuries into penetrating and crushing injuries. The latter being split into superficial, and deep, lacerating the meninges, the coverings of the brain. And he dealt with such patients by performing craniotomies, removing the bone overlying the injury to help remove the swelling. When dealing with spinal fractures, on the other hand, he noticed that the presence of sensation and pain were good prognostic indicators. No sensation and no pain meant that the spine was no longer intact or suitable for an operation. This understanding seems to have extended even to quarter equina syndrome, an uncommon 
but devastating spinal emergency where the nerves that are lower than the spinal cord become compressed. In such patients, he identified that fecal and urinary incontinence was indicative of a bad prognosis. Of course, despite all this achievement, Al-Zahrawi was limited by the era in which he lived. He couldn't, for example, help patients with poor prognostic factors like vomiting, seizures, delirium, thyroid eye disease. The technology and the medication to do so were just simply not available at the time. He also had no way of imaging to see where obstructions really were operating in a way that today's surgeons could only call blind. Indeed, compared to modern surgeons, he probably had to make many harsh decisions on who would survive the operations and who would not. All the same, no matter what his limitations, it's clear from the knowledge that he left behind that his baseline knowledge was exemplary across so many fields. It's one of the many things for which he's going to be remembered. Al-Zahrawi accomplished many remarkable things in his life. He wasn't only a surgeon, but a prominent physician and pharmacist, proving the heredity of haemophilia, using opiates and mandragora extracts for general anesthesia, using the alcohol in wine as a sterilizer, and quite possibly inventing lipstick and deodorant as well. As his career came to an end, he collated his life's work into Kitab al-Tasrif, a compilation of 50 years of practice, including, rather surprisingly, early descriptions of Cocker's method of reducing shoulder dislocations and a method of ligating blood vessels for migraine relief, 600 years in advance of its most famous practitioner, the military surgeon Ambroise Paré. His magnum opus, however, was the section on surgery and instruments. Three chapters that would cement his legacy for generations to come. None before him had ever published a treaty so comprehensive about surgical instruments and when to use them. In fact, in his lifetime, Al-Zahrawi invented over 200 instruments, double-tipped hooks, scapulars, specular, curettes, retractors, so many in such a short span of time that Donald Campbell, a historian of Arabic medicine notes Al-Zahrawi's methods lived on for five centuries, long after new inventions had superseded his own. Indeed, for his vast contributions to the field of surgery, he now holds the same scientific authority as Ibn Sina, known in the West as Avicenna, whose canon of medicine was the most encyclopedic summary of the medical field at that time. He's not forgotten to this day. In Cordoba, where he lived, the street that he lived on is called Cala Albacasis. The house where he lived and died at the age of 77 has been preserved with a commemorative plaque. While questions can be asked of why he isn't as famous as the Greek or Roman physicians, what cannot be questioned is his Atlas-like support of surgery's early foundations. The field just would not be the same without him. I hope you liked this latest deep dive into the history of neurosurgery. If you did, don't be afraid to leave a comment, like and subscribe to the channel to see more. Our next trip will be into the Renaissance era, the time of the polymaths like Vesalius and Da Vinci. And if you haven't seen the rest of this series, don't hesitate to look back through our archives and see how the specialty has developed. We've got something here for everyone. So see you next time.